Let's just have a word of prayer together. Lord, as we think about this passage, well, not this passage, but we think about this topic, this theme of, the, of joy, I ask and pray that you would speak to us. I ask and pray, Father God, that we will not just listen to the word, but actually will apply it to our own lives. May we be those that don't just hear the word, but put it into practice, live it out in our own lives. So Lord Jesus, would you come and teach us and help us, show us all that you want to reveal to us through your word, through passages of scripture. And Lord, may we each be strengthened, may we each be encouraged, may we each be challenged, but may we each be built up to walk well with you, Lord God, in all of the fruit of the Holy Spirit that you want to grow and develop in each of our lives, Lord God. So we welcome your presence in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So we're thinking of walking in the fruit of the Spirit, love. And I want to just begin by telling uh, a true story about a friend. You won't know him. No one here will know him. Let me tell you about Bill Black. Bill Black. Uh, he died, I think, about seven years ago. Bill was, um, went to school. He wasn't perhaps the brightest person at school. He found school a bit of a struggle, and he was, because he couldn't really, he wasn't so brilliant academically, he, he sort of started to play the clown as a way of cover-overing perhaps, you know, a little bit of his inabilities when it came to, to, to studies. Um, and so he's, he was quite a funny guy, but he, was, he, he played the clown. On the last day of his school, uh, when he was 16 years old, the headmaster called him into his office, and he said a few things to Bill. He said that he thought he was useless, he was worthless, and he called him a no-hoper. That's what one particular headmaster said to Bill Black uh, on his last day of school, that he was a, quote, no-hoper. He wouldn't do anything in the world. He wouldn't be anything. He'd, he'd, he'd waste his education. Bill grew up sort of with a difficult childhood, and although he tried to play the, the, the clown a little bit at times, actually, deep down, he... He felt that no one loved him. He didn't have any joy in his life. He, it, his his humour was a bit of a cover for actually a lack in his own life. Lack at school, people used to tease him sometimes. The teachers, head teacher wasn't very particularly kind to him, was he? But, um, and, and he went through life sort of without God and without any, any sense of the presence of God or much hope within him until he reached the age of just a little after 30. And he met some Christians, and he started to hear about Jesus. And he heard about a God who loved him. Now, for Bill, he wasn't going to quickly jump and follow a God who loved him, because he needed to be sure that this Jesus was for real. And it took Bill a little while, but eventually he realized that, yes, it was true. There is a God Almighty. His name is Jesus, who died for him, Bill, on the cross, and who loved him. And the day that Bill gave his life to Jesus, he was instantly transformed. All the hurt and the pain and the difficult sort of upbringing and childhood and schooling that he'd had, all that suddenly, God came and filled Bill with an amazing joy. And I only knew joy when he, uh, I only knew Bill when he was older in life, into his 70s and 80s, just before he died, uh, for about... Uh, six years probably, he was the most joyful person you could ever meet. If you saw Bill, if he was here now, I'd better spot him. He was radiant. He glowed with the presence of God. Because somebody who'd been empty and without any joy or any hope in his life had been filled so full with the joy of Jesus that he was changed. He was, he was infectious. If he was in the league hall at lunchtime, you would, you would notice Bill. He would be one of the most encouraging people, one of the most joyful people, had a smile on his face, not a put-on smile. It was coming from deep down because he knew the God who loved him. He knew the God who'd filled him with joy. We're thinking about this topic, what is joy? And not what is how the world defines joy, but actually how God defines joy. That's what we're going to be looking at. A number of different scriptures. And, and joy is like a deep inner gladness that comes from God. Yes, it is an emotion, but for a Christian, it's also a state of being. 
We are loved by God, whether we feel that love or not. It is a fact. Same with joy. We may sometimes feel more joyful or less joyful, but, but our joy is not dependent upon how we feel alone, although it's wonderful when we have those times of joy in God's presence. Our joy is a fact. It's a state of being, and hopefully as we look at some of these scriptures, we're going to see how the Bible defines the word joy, and actually the joy that God has, and also the joy that he wants us to be filled with too. So, first point. Jesus' joy can never be taken away. Jesus said in John 16, verse 22, Now is your time of grief, but I will see you again, and you will rejoice. When it says the word rejoice, that means joyful, filled with joy. And no one will take away your joy. The joy that God has for us doesn't come and go with the weather, with whether things are going well for us or not. It's a reality, it's a fact, it's a, it has a permanence about it. And in Romans chapter 8, we remember the words that say, nothing can separate us from the love of God. Nothing in all creation can separate us from the love of God. Nothing. Same is true with joy. We could put that word joy in there as well. Nothing can separate us from the joy that is in Jesus. Nothing, neither height nor depth, neither um, anything. For us, nothing can separate us from the joy that God has for us. It's good for us to know this and, and to be aware of it. It's not just a feeling or emotion. It is that, but it's much more than that too. Uh, it, and do you know, one of the things that the devil loves to do for every Christian, he loves to steal our joy away. The devil doesn't want any Christian feeling joyful or joy-filled. He wants to feel sad, depressed. Uh, yes, all the things Bill was, uh, hope, no hope, or all of those sort of things. The devil will always want to steal our joy away. And we need to not allow him to do that. Because God wants us to be in a state of joy-filledness, joyfulness. And as Jesus said, um, now is your time of grief. He was talking to the disciples. He's just about to go to the cross. The disciples are just about to, to witness Jesus being arrested, beaten, flogged, whipped, nailed to a cross. And the disciples have gone from, the, the, the disciples are deflated. They have got no joy. They are joyless once they see that happen. But what happens three days later when Jesus rises again from the dead? It says, when the disciples saw Jesus, they were overjoyed. They were overjoyed. They were filled with joy. And Jesus here says, he says, now is the time of your grief. I will see you again and you will rejoice and no one will take away your joy. And that is that sense of permanence about the joy that God has for you and for me. The disciples had that three days of grief and devastation when they thought that all their hopes were gone. But when they saw the risen Jesus, they came alive again. Every Christian, like the disciples, should have that sense of having seen the risen Jesus and actually being filled with joy. Yes, there will in life be times of grief and sadness and troubles and difficulties. Well, come to some of those in a little bit. But the the default situation for every Christian is to be joyful and to be joy-filled. That's what Scripture says. We'll see more of that in a moment. Jesus' joy is not dependent on circumstances. 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 16 particularly, Paul writes, Be joyful always. Pray continually Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Be joyful always. Be joyful in all circumstances. You might think, Matthew, that's a bit of a hard teaching. How can I be joyful if things are going wrong? How can I be joyful if you know, myself or someone else is really sick or Ill, Ill or dying? How can I be joyful in that way? The Word of God says, be joyful always. 
Be joyful in all circumstances. And the thing about Christian joy, it is not dependent upon our circumstances. If we went through life and our, and our lives reflected the circumstances of our life, for, lots, for much of the time, we would be depressed probably, we would be sad, we would be full of grief continually. We see all the troubles and, and brokenness in the world. But actually, the Bible teaches that the joy that we have in Jesus Christ is a joy that is an always joy and is a joy that does not depend upon circumstance. There's a great big difference between happiness and joy. Happiness is much more dependent on circumstances. Things are going well. It's a nice day. The sun's shining. Um, I've got some money in my bank account. Uh, I've just got a new this, that, or the other. Um, you know, I'm well fed. I've got, you know, things are comfortable. I've got a new job or whatever it might be. Happiness is much more dependent upon circumstances. But the joy that the Bible describes and talks about is irrespective of circumstances. We can know joy at all times and whatever our circumstances. And that's what the Bible is teaching. And you know, joy is a character of God. If you want to know what God is like, yes, he is full of love. But yes, God is also full of joy. God himself is joyful and joy-filled. And he wants all those who follow him to likewise be joyful and joy-filled, even when life is tough, even when we think we can't cope any longer. That's what the Word of God teaches uh, here. Uh, be joyful always. And, and actually, if you look at that scripture again, it says, be joyful always, pray to me, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. In other words, it's actually God's will for all those who follow Jesus to be joyful. Something to think about, isn't it? Have you ever thought that it's God's will for you to be joyful and to be joy-filled? Mm, that's interesting, Matthew. That's a little bit of a challenge. It's God's will that I would be joyful and joy-filled. Next, next point is this. Jesus' joy is a joy that is complete. Again, Jesus speaking, John 16, verse 24, ask and you will receive and your joy will be complete. The joy that Jesus gives is a complete joy. It's a joy that can be and should be 100%. It should be 24-7, 365 days a year. There isn't a day when we wake up where God says, you don't really have to be joyful today. And while we don't have to put on a show of joy or a pretense of joy, that's not the joy. Joy comes when we realize who God is and who we are in God. And that is a deep joy that nothing and no one can take away from us. That's the joy that God wants to develop in our Christian lives and in our Christian walk. And when we re realize, a little bit like Bill Black did, that Jesus has dealt with his past. Jesus is dealing with his present. And Jesus will deal with his future. When we apply that to ourselves as well, you know that Jesus has dealt with our past when he died on the cross. He's dealing with us now. He wants to make us more like Jesus. And he has our future in his hands. When we're aware of those three key things, actually joy can become to well up. And we don't have to be so bound by life's circumstances. I think far too many Christians are bound by life's circumstances. And sometimes we forget to step back and see the big picture that actually it's God's will for us to be joyful and to be joy-filled. Jesus' joy is an always joy. One or two points slightly overlap each other. And perhaps this one does a little bit. But Jesus' joy is an always joy. Paul here writing, Philippians 4 and verse 4 says, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Rejoice and joy, pretty much one and the same word. Here Paul is saying, rejoice in the Lord when? Always. 
Hey, if you didn't get it the first time, I'm going to say it a second time. I'll say it again. Rejoice. Hey, guys, yeah, I, you weren't wrong when you heard me the first time. Be joyful. Be joy-filled. Where is Paul writing these words from? Paul in Philippians is writing from in prison. He's in prison. He's probably chained. Uh, he doesn't have his freedom. He cannot come to church on Sunday. He is restricted. He's got a prison diet. He's got prison conditions. He's got filth and unpleasantness all around him. And where does Paul exhort us to be joyful and joy-filled? Writing from a prison cell. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. If he's writing it from a palace, we can maybe understand it. He's writing it from a prison. That's the, that's the joy that God wants to begin to work in us. And we're certainly working in Paul's life, even from a prison cell. And you know, one of the wonderful things about joy is joy isn't permanent, as I said before. It's, it's, it's forever. Heaven is a place of everlasting joy. Did you know that? There's going to be much joy in heaven. Heaven is a place of everlasting joy. God's love endures forever. God's joy endures forever. Heaven will be a place of everlasting joy. Let me read to you Isaiah 35 and verse 10. It says this. Everlasting joy will crown their heads. Gladness and joy will overtake them. And sorrow and sighing will flee away. Heaven is going to be a place of unbridled, amazing joy. And God wants to begin to work his joy within us right now as Christians. It's a character of God and it's a character that God wants to work in every Christian life to be more joyful. Do you know, sometimes as Christians, we can look like we've just sucked on a, a lemon. You know, we've got a soured face and we're sort of all those sort of things. That's not what God has for us. He wants us to be radiate with the joy that comes from knowing Jesus. The confidence we can have in that God has got our past, our present, and our future covered. No other God has. There is no other God. There is only one. And his name is Jesus Christ. And, and God wants us want to work his joy in our character now as Christians. And that will help to prepare us for heaven where there will be eternal everlasting joy and Jesus himself was full of joy Jesus was full of joy it says in Luke 10 verse 21 it says in, he's just sent out the 12, 10, 12 and the 72 2 by 2 and they come back and it says Jesus full of, the, of joy through the Holy Spirit Jesus himself models for us a joy filled life he had lots of pressures lots of hassles Three years of everybody trying to trip him up and the Sadducees and the Pharisees and the teachers of the law trying to, you know, every day for Jesus when he's out on the street, people always trying to have a go at him, telling him he was no good and wrong. He, he remained joyful despite all that he went through. He models for us joy. God the Father is full of joy. Jesus is filled with joy. The Holy Spirit is full of joy. It is the character of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, each of them full of joy, joy-filled, and Jesus models that. Jesus wasn't someone who was empty of joy. He was filled with joy. And I don't know if you think about yourself or if I think about myself, joyless, joyful, where are we on that line at the moment? Does the joyless one ring a bit more? Is it the joy-filled? God wants to grow his character within each and every one of us. Yes, understanding of theology, but also a Christ-like character. That is such a critical ingredient of discipleship, our character. And often we work on our theology and we neglect our character. That is not a good combination. I'm always cautious of Christians who think they've got their theology totally taped. And I look at their character and I think, I don't see love, joy, peace, patience, all any of the fruit of the Spirit in your life. You might have worked on your theology, but you haven't worked on your character, and God will judge us massively on the character, his character, how much of the character of Jesus we have in our lives, 
not just our theology. It's going to heaven it isn't a, <laughs> a theological test. Yes, we need to be saved and we need to have committed our life to following Jesus and we need to grow in our theological understanding. But we have to work on our character. And if you're a Christian and you thought, oh, I got my theology, I've never really thought about my character very much. Let me tell you, your character, my character is critical to God. He wants to grow his likeness in you and in me. And actually Jesus wants us to become like him, more and more like him. And joy is just one. We're going to take a number of them. We've taken love last week. Joy today is one of those characters that God wants to increasingly see in our lives. Jesus' joy gives strength. Jesus' joy gives strength. A number of scriptures could have taken here. I've taken Nehemiah 8 verse 12. The joy of the Lord is your strength. The joy of the Lord is your strength. The joy of the Lord isn't just a feeling. It's just not just an emotion. Actually, when we ask God to please God, make me more joyful, make me more like Jesus, make me more rejoicing, make, make me less joyless and more joyful. Great prayer to pray. But the more we ask God and allow the joy of Jesus to fill us, the more we will find ourselves strengthened. Not physically strengthened with biceps like Popeyes, but spiritually strengthened within our spirit. Because joy strengthens us in the inner person. Joy strengthens us. Let me tell you about a guy called uh, Cyprian. Uh, Cyprian of Carthage. He he, uh, was martyred about 250 AD. He lived in a time when towards the end of the Roman Empire, and they, they were still having some persecution of Christians. And the first persecution, he survived. Second persecution, he didn't survive. Um, he, he was uh, from uh, Carthage, which is in modern-day Tunisia. So he was from North Africa, um, from Tunisia. And he, was a, he, he actually wasn't a Christian until his mid-30s. I think at about 35 years of age, he became a Christian. And God changed him. He gave lots of his possessions away. He followed God. He quickly, you know, was ordained, became a bishop. And, and he, you know, later on in his life is, is, is martyred. He, he dies a martyr's death. And this is what he wrote to somebody shortly beforehand, somebody who was thinking about the Christian faith. And this is what he wrote. He said, Cyprian of Carthage, it's a bad world, an incredibly bad world. But I have discovered in the midst of it a quiet and holy people who have learned a great secret. They have found a joy which is a thousand times better than any pleasure of our sinful life. They are despised and persecuted, but they don't care. They are masters of their their souls. They have overcome the world. These people are the Christians and I am one of them. And when he goes up before the magistrate, you know, the magistrate asks him to recant his faith in Jesus, and he is full of joy. He will not do that. So he's tortured, and then he's beheaded, cut off a sword. They, they cut off his head. But there's, a, there's a, a Christian who understood the joy of the Lord, even when facing persecution, and even when becoming a martyr. He still knew the joy of Jesus and never uh, went back on that. Next point. Similar to one I've already made, but I'm going to share it from a slightly different angle. Jesus' joy enables, enables us to face every situation. Habakkuk 3 verse 18 says, I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Savior. The sovereign Lord is my strength. He enables me to walk on the heights. Habakkuk 3.18. We have, haven't got time to expand Habakkuk. Maybe another time, if you ask me, we'll do Habakkuk. We'll do a little mini-series. Habakkuk, one of the minor prophets in the Old Testament, awesome book, just three chapters, and we could do a little mini-series of three on it sometime, maybe. And I've just come straight to the very end of chapter three, and I've read those words that came up about uh, rejoicing the Lord. But let me tell you why 
this is so significant. Let me tell you Habakkuk's situation in just a, very briefly. Habakkuk was a, an Old Testament prophet, and God spoke to him, and God showed him one or two things that were going to happen, which Habakkuk was not happy about. They sometimes call it Habakkuk's complaint. He wasn't actually complaining against God. He was just saying, God, really? Are you sure? It's an amazing book in the Bible. Because God has revealed to Habakkuk that actually his nation, the nation of Israel, is going to get invaded by the Babylonians. God reveals to Habakkuk before it happens that men, most of the people of Israel are going to get taken away into captivity. That Jerusalem is going to be ransacked. That the temple is going to be destroyed. And Habakkuk is, no, 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 God. These things can't happen. This, is, this would be her- terrible. And he says, God, surely you cannot... You cannot be serious, really? Is that going to happen? And the Babylonians of all people, the most wicked, horrendous people, are going to come and do all those things? And let me read what Habakkuk says. He, he doesn't complain against God, but he asks God two questions, and God answers him. And then the answer is settled for Habakkuk, and this is what he says. It's not going to be up on the screen, but I'm just reading it from, from the scripture. The, the, the two verses immediately before the one that just came up. Habakkuk says this at the end of his interaction with God. Though the fig tree does not bud and there are no grapes on the vine. In other words, the future looks bleak. Though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no fruit, no food. In other words, there's no food anywhere to be had. You can go to, you can go to 7-Eleven, Tops, any, there's no food to be had anywhere. No markets, no food. All the food is gone. There's a famine. Though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls, often they were used as a security. In other words, all the security that that the nation and Habakkuk ever thought they had, all their security, all their investments, all their savings, gone. Yet, I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Savior. And he goes on to say... You know, the sovereign Lord of my strength, he enables me to walk on the heights. So there's Habakkuk in the most bleakest of situations saying, God, I don't quite understand why, but I respect that that is your will. And do you know what? And even in these circumstances, I choose to rejoice in the Lord because I know that you won't fail. And I know that you're in control. And I know that even though I don't understand all that's happening, I can trust you. And Habakkuk has the joy of the Lord, uh, even in circumstances that are really difficult. That's, that's a, for another series. Great book, Habakkuk. Um, okay. We're nearly there. You all okay? Anyone need to stretch or... Uh, <laughs> if your neighbor's fallen asleep, just give them a prod. <clears throat> We're nearly there. Jesus' joy is found in God's presence. Jesus' joy is found in God's presence. Psalm 16, verse 11. You fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. And he also, this is almost like David's testimony. My heart leaps for joy and I will give thanks to him in song. These two verses reflect David's testimony. David was a person who'd learned to enjoy God's presence. When he was a shepherd boy out in the field, days and weeks and probably months all alone with his little guitar, playing and singing to God, listening to God, seeing God in creation, spending time in God's presence. And he says, you will fill me with joy in your presence. If we're too busy, if we're too rushed, if the business of the world is our number one priority and we don't have time even a little time every day to put God first, we probably won't be a very joy-filled Christian. We'll be a stressed Christian. We'll be a, I've sucked on lemon Christian. It's not what God wants us to be. David here shows us the secret of a joy-filled life. We receive the joy of God when we spend quality time in his presence, listening to him, praying to him, reading the word of God, asking him to fill us with his joy with his likeness, with his love. So spending quality time with God is a key to growing in our joy. And then, final point, final point. And in fact, it's a point, there's a scripture that I read right at the beginning of the service. 
Zephaniah 3, verse 17. Jesus sings over you with joy. Zephaniah 3, 17. The Lord your God is with you. He is mighty to save. He will take great delight in you. He will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. Ah, a sermon in itself, but even just that last phrase, God rejoices over you with singing. Do you believe that? It's true. It's absolutely true. And the incredible thing about that little last phrase, God rejoices over us with singing. For all those who commit their way to following Jesus Christ. It, there's a, 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 a picture here, an image here, of a father and a little child. If you think of a father taking a little child and maybe lying him down in his cot or on his bed, you know, maybe the child's only this big. And what does a ch- father do just before it's night time and the child's going to go to sleep? Sings over that child with joy. Wants that ch- child to know that they're secure, that they're safe that actually their dad will always be there for them. And there's a beautiful picture of a father singing over a child, God singing over you and me. And you might think, well, I'm too big, I'm too tough, I'm too strong, I don't need God singing over me. Let me say, we do. Every and each and every one of us needs to know that God has a love for you and for me, and God wants to express his joy over you and me because he wants a relationship. He wants us to be filled with his joy. That's part of his character and personality. And he wants us to be confident of who he is too and that actually he loves us so much that he would sing over us with joy. Now, when I look at my life, I'm slightly, um, I think, God, does everything I do make you want to sing songs of joy over me. God, I know there are some things maybe I think or say or do that actually not quite sure you really want to sing joy over me over that one. But actually, when we've committed to following Jesus Christ our Lord and Savior, God is committed to singing over us with joy. He wants us to be confident of his joy and he wants us to grow in his joy. In other words, joy is something that God gives And it's also something that God is. Let's ask and pray that God would fill us with his joy. As we just come to an end now, Uh, you've been sitting for a while. I'm going to just encourage us, let's respond to God. Let's just stand up where we are, all of us. I encourage you just to stand where we are. I'm just going to pray a prayer. I'm going to pray a prayer that God would fill us with his joy. I don't know, you... You know, if you're someone who says, joy, you can stay right out there. God will. He won't force his joy or his love upon you if you don't want it. It, Sorry, here's the summary of them. I had to put the font a bit smaller just to try and squeeze them all in. If anyone wants to take a screenshot, I know some people like to, then those are all the different nine points that uh, made many more points we could have made. Um, Walking in the fruit of the Spirit, joy. But as we stand in God's presence now, you might like to just close your eyes and hold out your hands. We might need to say to God, God, I'm really sorry that I've been so joyless. I'm so sorry that I allowed the troubles of the world and the circumstances to dictate my level of joy. And Lord, I say from now on, it's not the circumstances of the world that dictate joy. Jesus, it's you that are my conductor. You are the one whom I ask and pray, please would you fill me with your joy. I confess my joylessness. And I ask you this day to fill me with your joy. Thank you, Lord. And Lord, as we stand in your presence, we've been thinking about the character of joy. And Lord, I pray, Father, Jesus, Holy Spirit, would you come now upon each one of us? And Lord, would you open us to receive 
the joy of the Lord. May the joy of the Lord become a greater reality within each one of us than he has ever been before. I pray, Lord, that you would, where we've allowed stress and troubles, Lord, we don't sweep them under the carpet. But right now, we're standing in your presence, the presence of Jesus Nazarene, and asking you to unlock a heart with joy. And Lord, we choose to open a heart towards you and ask you to fill us with a joy we don't fully understand. Yet may it become more and more of our character, of our nature. And I pray, Lord God, for some of us, you would just put a real spirit of joy upon us. Laughter, joy, gladness in your presence. Come, Holy Spirit, come and impart your joy deep down. Lord, for some of us who that might even result in laughter and joy in your presence. I pray, Lord, come and fill us with your joy. Holy Spirit, work your joy deep within our minds, our spirits, our lives, our present and our future. Come, Holy Spirit, come and fill us with your joy. Lord, I pray for a, like water bubbling in a brook. Jesus said, come to me, all you who are thirsty, come and drink. And Lord, as we drink from you, I pray that, Lord, even if we're going through real difficult, calamitous circumstances in our lives, I pray for that bubbling brook of joy to, become, to begin welling up within us. The joy of the Lord to begin to well up within us. We welcome you, Holy Spirit. We welcome your joy to grow and strengthen us and develop in our lives. Fill us with your joy, Lord. We ask for it. We pray for it. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. Stir us. Fill us. We receive your joy. Break down our walls. Break down our barriers. Break down our hardness towards you. Give us soft hearts, soft minds, and a willingness to reach out and receive all that you want to give us. And you want to give us of your joy. Loose it among us, Lord, I pray. Release it among us. By the power of your Holy Spirit, we ask.